Hey, for the interweb people. And we're welcoming them. Oh, and we're welcoming them. Hey, y'all. Well, thank you all for coming. We're talking this morning. We're going to talk a little bit about Genesis chapter 7 and 8. So somebody told me, he said, are you going to go and walk all the way through Genesis? And I said, yeah. And I said, you know, we're going to be Genesis in Genesis for over a year. And I went, oh. <laughs> so we're going to have to put this in fast forward a little bit. We're going to have to glean what we can and then go through. And you know what? When we get through, we'll come back and pick up anything we miss. All right? We're going, to, we're going to talk about Genesis 7 and 8. And the title of this message is Rock the Boat. Rock the boat. Don't tip the boat over. <laughs> we're going to reckon some truth in God's Word. And I'm hoping that this truth that we reckon today, you guys all grab a hold of it and take it home with you and apply it to your lives. Because if you're not doing that, then what are we doing here? We're here to worship God and we're here to, to glean what we can from His Word. So I want to talk a, about how we're supposed to be kind of radical. We're not supposed to be lackadaisical. We're not supposed to be lazy, but we are, aren't we? Yeah. So if you're all lazy bump of Jesus, raise your hand. <laughs> Listen, we're supposed to be radical. We're suppo- our faith is supposed to be out there. It's supposed to be on our sleeves. People are supposed to be able to look at us and see Jesus. That's why you're called Christians. Christ-like. Christians. This guy, Noah. Wow. What a guy. You think he was a little radical for his time? This guy, is, man, he is one interesting dude. I'm telling you what, the more I, I read about him, the more I'm just impressed. So we're going to pull... Five, just five. There's a whole lot more, but for time's sake, we're going to pull five powerful truths out of Genesis 7 and 8. And uh, let's get right to it. In the very first verse of Genesis 7, we see that Noah is called out as righteous. And and the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Now, we got that, right? God saying he's righteous. Let's think about for a minute what Noah went through. For over a hundred years, he was mocked, he was teased, he was scorned. I think it would have been really easy for Noah to go, yeah, you know what, can this, I'm out. You know, there's a, there's a lot of pressure out there. And we don't even have, we don't have anywhere near the pressure that he had, the peer pressure he had, and yet we we oftentimes crumble, don't we? Yes. Like, well, okay, now this isn't a good spot to talk about Jesus. I'll just hold my peace until there's a, a better opportunity. There's not a better opportunity. The opportunity is now. The opportunity is when the Holy Spirit puts it on your heart. And if you're thinking, yeah, this isn't a good time, that. You wouldn't even be thinking that unless the Holy Spirit had put it on your heart. So if that thought ever enters your mind, oh, this isn't a good time, that is exactly the time. That is when you're supposed to speak out. That is when you're supposed to start looking for a way in the conversation that you can get God in there. Everybody mocked him. He was probably the brunt of many jokes. I can't even begin to. No, we're not going to go there. I can stand up here and tell you joke. We have to joke about no one, but we're not going to do that. He stood fast. He was never swayed. He got the job done. He did exactly what God told him to do. And you know what? In the end, it was Noah and his family that survived. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we teach us your way, Lord. Lord, show us the path, that narrow path, that difficult path that leads to salvation, Lord. We all want to go there. Lord, that's the longing of our heart. That's the desire that we have. Lord, if it wasn't, we wouldn't be here. So, Lord, we pray right now for your Holy Spirit to just pour out onto us wisdom and understanding and discernment in your word. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. So this first verse, do you think we might have a few takeaways just from this first verse? Listen, 
I could do probably five sermons just on this first verse. And there's probably guys out there have been doing this longer than me that could do hundreds of sermons on this first verse. But then it would take us 20 years to get through Genesis. <laughs> How many times? How many times? Have we felt God urging us? And we failed to respond. That's true. This whole thing with Susie, the homeless woman, um, God urged Cindy to do something. Cindy urged me. <laughs> and by that, God urged me. Because I know if God puts it on Cindy's heart, that it, it ought to be on my heart as well. We missed an opportunity to do God's work an opportunity to serve. And that's what they are, y'all. They're opportunities. Because the thing is, is when we're obedient to God's calling, he doesn't just go, yeah, awesome. No, he pours his blessing out because we've been obedient. You see, Noah was obedient. He was counted as righteous. He had to build a boat. Where did he get the wood? I'm thinking about it. Where did he get Where did he get the wood? God provided the wood. God provided the pine pitch and tar to seal the boat up. God provided the animals to come and not fight with one another. God provided, whoa. You see this little act that would be, and it's not really a little act, I mean building a boat in the desert. Not a little boat, a big boat. <laughs> Suffering scorn for over 100 years. That's no little thing. So the blessing is going to be big. God doesn't leave us high and dry. And God calls us to rock the boat. So that brings me to my first truth. If we truly love God, we will obey his commands. People are going, oh man, now it's going to talk about the command thing. You know, I don't, I don't really want to do anything. I just want to, I, I just want to be, you know, I just want to be saved. I don't want to go to hell, but I don't really want to be stuck having to do something. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Amen. You see, when we get saved, if we're truly saved, it changes something inside of us. And we have a longing, we have a desire that's placed in us through the Holy Spirit that dwells in us to do God's work. And he gives us the assignments. I don't do it. It's not my job to pick out what y'all are supposed to do. If it was, this church would be done already. My house would be done already. <laughs> I'd have a nicer car. <laughs> now, the point I'm trying to make is that your walk is your walk. Your walk isn't my walk, and your walk isn't any less important than my walk. You see, Paul talks about this. He says, how can the hand say to the eye that he's more important than the eye? Well, without the eye, the hand can't even, you know, the hand can't even see what it's supposed to grab without the eye, can it? But does that make the eye more important? The eye can't grab anything. <laughs> if you got an eyeball to grab something, don't do it. It'd freak me out. <laughs> We all have something that we're supposed to do. Paul tells us that we have good works that God planned for us since before time began. So the question is, are you doing them? Are you walking in that faith that says, yes, I'm going to do what God's calling me to do? Or are you going, well, God never called me to do anything. Because, listen, that's a lie from the pit of hell. If somebody says you don't have to do anything as a Christian, that's a lie. You see, we've been we've been we've been spoon fed a watered down gospel in this country for too long, and it's time for us to to realize that we're accountable whether we want to be or not. And listen, if I'm accountable to somebody and I'm not doing what I'm accountable for. That makes me uncomfortable, but if I'm accountable to God, that takes it to a whole nother level. 
And I'm telling you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are accountable to God. Because Jesus is the one that's going to judge you in the end. And what does the book say? It says he's going to judge you based on the good and the bad that you did. Your works. Now, it doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. Your salvation is secure in your faith in Jesus, but your reward, ooh. And if you're one of those guys that says, well, I don't care if I'm a janitor and cleaning toilets as long as I'm in heaven. Listen, you don't realize what you're saying. You don't realize what you're going to be missing out on. You take the best of the goodness that he can give you here and multiply it by millions because that's what you're going to have up there. We don't do those things that God urges us to do because we're afraid we're going to look foolish. <laughs> we're afraid that, yeah. that people might make fun of us. Uh-huh. Or that people might not think too highly of us because well, we're one of them goofy Christians. Mm-hmm. Let's not rather be a goofy yeah. saved Christian than a dead and condemned human. Mm-hmm. And I'm supposed to take anybody and everybody I can with me, right? And believe it or not, that works both ways. Those who are not saved, they want to drag anybody and everybody with them into hell. There's a division. If we jump down a little bit, we'll see that if we truly love God, we will obey His commands. Look at, at, chapter, at verse 5 of chapter 7. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. Oh man, I wish that was me. I wish that could be said about me. Listen, he pulled me out of of my my salvation, my forgiveness is so big. And yet I still hold back from him. And he all do that. And they hold back from God. Hmm. And you might be thinking, well, God never really commanded me to do anything. And if you're thinking that right now, I want you. <laughs> this is, you might want to think that through a little bit. Because this book, when I read this book, it is literally loaded with commands. You know, well, that only applies to Israel. Listen, Jesus said, not one jot or tittle of the law will be removed. Just telling you. Now, does that mean we have to start doing sacrifices again? No. <laughs> Jesus completed that work once and for all. What that means is that God has commands for us. He has told us what to do. Jesus himself, God in the flesh, clarified these things. But even he said, keep my commands. Look at John 14, 15. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Just like Noah received salvation from the flood and destruction from the rest of the world by being obedient to God, we receive salvation through Jesus Christ. And because of that salvation, we should long to be obedient to him. Does that mean that we're going to walk the straight line for the rest of our lives? That we're never going to mess up? No, that's not what I'm I'm asking to do. That's not what I'm saying. We have a loving God. He loved us so much, he sent his son to die for our sin. And if we believe in him, then we'll have everlasting life. That's all there is to it. We're going to heaven. But if this same person that hung up on that cross and paid the penalty for my sin, if he asked me to do something, what do I owe him? What am I going to hold back from him? Yeah, we got to get our heads straight on this, y'all. We've been so bombarded by the world and by the devil that we just we can't even hardly think and see straight anymore. Listen, you've got to get into this. You've got to see what's real. Because all of this out here, this is the illusion. Real is eternal. It's forever. And when 
you leave this life, you're going one of two places, and that's all there is to it. There's no in between. People say, well, I'm kind of on the fence about that. Well, I got to tell you, the devil owns the fence. So what exactly did Jesus command us to do? He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But do you want to be more like Jesus? Is that the desire of your heart? Would you like to know him better? Is that the desire of your heart? Well, let's look at John 14, 21. This isn't our message. I, there's a lot from John in here because John, <laughs> the Bible says it better than I can say. Does that make sense? He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he is it is it loved by me. And he that loveth me shall be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. I'll make myself known to him. Who? The one that keeps his commandments. Jesus himself followed the commands of God. John 14, 31, Jesus said, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me a commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. Where are they going? They're going to the garden where he'll be arrested and he'll be taken as prisoner and beaten and then hung on a cross. Let that soak for a second. This isn't light duty stuff. Being a Christian, not light duty. Being a Christian is hard. John 15, 10 says, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So what's the primary thing that, that Jesus tells us to do? Love the Lord with all you got. He, Isaiah said at first, Jesus, when he repeats it, he adds to it. He adds strength to it. He says, with all your mind, all your body, all your strength. You know, the second thing Jesus tells us is to love one another. And this is the next truth I want to pull out of here. That Jesus commands us to love one another. Not a suggestion. You see, God doesn't make suggestions. I, I want you to get over that in a hurry. You know, God doesn't say, well, you, you might want to try this. No, God says, do this, and then you choose. And when you choose, you're making the choice who you're going to be following. Because there's only two to follow. God and Satan. It really boils down to that, y'all. And if you're not serving the living God, then who are you serving? You're going to have one or two masters. And when Jesus commanded us to love one another, he didn't just command us to love the way we think we ought to love. He said, love as he has loved us. Listen, he died for you. Yes, he did. And he's saying, I want you to love everybody around you like I loved you. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my word. John 15, 12. Love. And I have loved you. Can we even grasp the deepness of that? Can you even wrap your head around? Because who's Jesus talking about here? I mean, who is your one another? Who's my one another? Who are we supposed to love? And I'll tell you, Jesus just, he turned the world upside down. He rocked the boat. Everything that we thought was right, we had it all wrong. And Jesus came and said, this is the right way. He rocked the boat. Jesus was the radical of radicals. 
In Matthew 5, verses 43 and 44, he said, You have heard that it, it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. And do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Dang, it's easy to like somebody that's likable, isn't it? <laughs> but that isn't what it says here, is it? Right. So my one and other has to include these people that I don't even like. Mm -hmm. Why would God do that? <laughs> I don't. I don't even like. That. How many of you ever met somebody that's hard to like? Mm -hmm. Come on, be honest. <laughs> that's right. We all met somebody. I'm not really that good at this. Okay. This is one where I kind of fail. And I'm asking God to make me better. Okay, so we can all ask God, can y'all do better? Yes. I can do better. Yeah. But somebody unlikable, man, I, I'm sorry, I don't like them. Mm -hmm. They're unlikable, right? Yeah. That's a confession, y'all. And the Bible tells us that I'm being obedient now. I'm confessing. This is, And that's a sin. Listen, you need to understand that when you don't do what God commands you to do, that's a sin. Plain and simple. Teddy comes home and says, there's this woman, Susie, this homeless. Yeah, I saw her. <laughs> you think we should do No, we don't need to do anything. It's okay. She, she's there because of her choices. So he comes back to me a few hours later saying, I can't get her off my horn. Really? <laughs> that, yeah. Then she goes on until I stop and talk to her. You did? And I'm like, okay, so her smell didn't rub off on me. That's good. <laughs> See, there's people to smell bad. And there's people that have checked out of society by their choice. And we can take a hard line and go, hey, you made those choices. Right? And we can allow our hearts to get hard. But we can understand that Jesus loves them as much as he loves us. Jesus died for them the same way he died for us. And that there is no one on this earth that is breathing that is without value. Mm -hmm. You know, and I want to speak about Israel right now. I do want to interject in here. Y'all don't be fooled by the enemy. I don't care what the media shows. I don't care what the world says. God says to support Israel. Yes, man. Hallelujah. Yes, if we turn our back on Israel, we're done. Mm -hmm. We're toast. And we should be making a stink about this whole situation in these colleges. We should be writing letters to our congressmen. We should be writing letters to the deans. We should be doing, we should be taking action. We need to get radical. Yeah. You're going, well, hey, pastor, you're just, you're, you're talking about political stuff. No, I'm talking about faith stuff. I'm talking about Bible stuff. I'm talking about what the Lord has commanded us. Right. The words of my dad, long dead dad. United States, the people of the United States got to grow a pair. We got to get tough. We got to get radical. We got to stand up and say, no, not here. No more. We're not doing this. What's going on is literally insidious. And if you don't think it's going to get worse, you are sadly mistaken. But listen, all that has to happen for evil to overrun completely is for good people to do nothing. We gotta love those unlovable people. We gotta step out in faith. And you know what? Every time I ever have, I've made a lifelong friend. Every time. 
And even if they move on and I don't ever see him again, they're still my friend. I still pray for them. I still think about them. I still ask the Lord to watch over them because they're my friends. And you know what? It's always, I don't know why I'm resistant to it. If there's somebody from first depression, I don't particularly care for. I don't know why I don't, I'm not quicker to get over that and over myself. But here's something I want to tell you. You cannot have a second first impression. So if the first impression goes bad, then you need to try harder. You need to try to change that first impression. Does that make sense? Yes. Here's the third truth. Let's just move on. God will always keep his end of the bargain. Amen. God always does what God says he's going to do. He says, I am God. If I say it, will I not do it? Listen, when God speaks, that's a big deal. You know, this whole thing that we live in called the universe, God spoke and it sprang into existence. And the thing that's cool right now is that all of our scientists are now saying, yes, the universe definitely had a beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yes, it was definitely sudden. Well, that just, that just points me to Jesus and points me to God. And I don't know how you can believe in the science of the beginning of the universe and not believe in God. I don't know how that, how can you separate that? That's like trying to get the white stuff off of the orange. <laughs> You know, you didn't get that. <laughs> if we're obedient to what God wants us to do, we get to witness <clears throat> His wonderful provision and His glorious blessings. God always holds up His end. You know, and I want to point out here, because there's a, the example of this that I in Genesis 7 I shared it with Bible study this morning is in verses 2 and 3 it says of every clean beast thou shalt take thee by sevens the male and his female and of the beasts that are not clean by two the male and his female of the fowls of the air also by sevens the male and the female and keep seed alive along, upon the face of the earth and then we jump forward to Genesis 8, 20, it says, Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. How many of y'all thought that it was two by two? Okay, there was two of every kind of unclean animal, but the clean ones, there were seven. That's an odd number. Why would God do so? <laughs> because in Genesis 8, 20, Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt alterings on the altar. God provided the sacrifice. That's true. God provided the sacrifice by having one extra bird, one extra clean animal come onto that ark. I don't think I don't think Noah lacked for anything. Like I said before, he got the wood, he got everything he needed to build the boat, uh, and that and that brings me to, back to the announcement we had a little bit earlier. We're gonna Jim is gonna he's agreed to teach a class in biblical finance, and and several of you said you were interested in doing that last week. It's not a class on how to get rich. Okay. Anybody that stands up with the Bible and says, let me show you the Bible principles to get rich, they're lying and run. Yeah. Okay? It doesn't make you, well, I should well. say, it doesn't make you wealthy. But following these principles will make your life rich. Amen? Amen. It's, a class, it's a class on how to honor God with what he's given us. And it, if you're interested, then just hang out here in the sanctuary for a minute after we're dismissed, and we'll, we'll set a day, a day of the week that works for everybody. I don't want anybody to miss this opportunity because one of the biggest ways that God can bless you 
is through your finances. And if you do them in a biblical and godly manner, then he pours his blessing out. Back in God's provision. The Bible is filled with God's provision. It's, it's full of it, you know. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, if that's not a provision, I don't know what it is. That's the biggest provision there is. We get to get rid of our unrighteousness. He does it. You can't do it. I can't do it. And we're told to confess our sins in so many different ways throughout the Bible. If we're obedient to that command, God's promise and his provision follow. If he says it, is he going to do it? And James 5, 16 says, Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You see how that works? Speaking of works, hmm. Like I told you before, God commanded us to do good works. If you don't think so, let's look at Matthew 5, 16. Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Every once in a while, someone will come up to me and they'll say, Man, you're just doing such a great work here in this community. I'm like, No, I'm not. It's not me. Sometimes I want to say, what are you talking about? I don't even like you. <laughs> it's not me doing this. It's God doing this. God is the one doing this. And God gets the glory and God gets the credit. I don't want any credit for what God is doing. And I don't want anybody to try and put that on me. I can't carry that load. I'm telling you the truth. What's happening here in this community, in this church, this is a God thing. It's a divine thing. Amen. He's doing it. Give glory to him. Amen. The fourth truth I want to share is what we started talking about here. God's got stuff for us to do. <laughs> in Ephesians, Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Listen, if God has already ordained for you to walk in them, but you still have a free will, don't you think you ought to maybe bend your will a little bit and maybe you ought to walk in those things that he called you to? Do we have what it takes to do what God is calling us to do? No. That's a short answer. No, you don't. You don't have it in your pockets. It's by his power, by his authority, that we can do these works that he's called us to. If we submit to him, his power and his authority come. And he gives us everything we need to do what he's calling us to do. Look at 2 Corinthians 9 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. I kind of wish it said some efficiency in some things. <laughs> but that's not what it says, is it? For me, that, that particular scripture leaves us without excuse. We can't say, well, that, you know, honestly, it's not my personality. Who controls your personality? You say, well, no, a cat can't, can't, can't change its stripes. You're not a cat. <laughs> I think a huge amount of the story of Noah and what is taught in Genesis 7 and 8 is about God's magnificent provision. Noah did everything that God commanded and God provided everything for the ark. And because of that, he survived and he got to live for a while and see his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, how many generations came out of Noah? All of us, y'all. Y'all came out of that family. Every one of you. And people are like, well, how could there be like two of every kind of critter? Listen, there wasn't two of every kind of critter. There was 
two cats. And all the cats that we have now on this earth came from those two cats. And you say, well, how could that be? Well, I don't know. I look around this room, I see some different color here. Right? We don't all look the same. Some of us are big. <laughs> some of us are not so big. <laughs> I tease me, I tease you too. We're all different, right? So why, God, why couldn't God take two cats and make all the cats? Why couldn't God take two lizards and make all the lizards? Because we're talking about what God did here. And the evidence surrounding this whole story is too large for us to deny. So even though you might be saying, well, you know, God really hasn't told me to do anything. He hasn't really done anything for me. Somebody ever tells you that, what, you know, my dear God hasn't done anything for me. I want you to point out the fact that they're breathing. <laughs> that life that they have is a gift from God. Right? And that just proves the point that God even provides for those that deny him. He says, I will cause my rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He provides even for those that scorn him, that scorn us, that deny him, that refuse him. Why does he do that? Well, listen, I thank the good Lord he does that because I used to be one of them. And now I'm saved through the blood of Christ. Amen. So, is there anybody that can fall short when they've got the blood of Christ? No. When Jesus uh, spoke about God's provision, his wonderful, gracious provision, and listen, y'all might look around and go, man, I don't have anything. You have everything you need. And if you want more than what you need, well, the Bible's pretty clear on that. Go to work. Right. Paul said, if you don't work, you don't eat. Amen. This church has helped a lot of folks out in the last four years that I know of, and I'm not tooting my horn. But there's always going to be a time when mm -hmm. the gravy train runs out, when we will no longer help you because you haven't helped yourself. It's just the way it is, and it's the way of the Bible. The Bible teaches us that that's what we're supposed to do. But when Jesus talks about it, he says it this way. In Matthew 6, 33, he says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So what's the key to all these things, whatever all these things is? What's the key to it? Seek God first. How many of y'all seek God first every minute of every day? I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> but listen, you know, we can, we can all do better, right? The thing is, it's the level of commitment that's in us. Am I committed to doing better? Am I committed to trying harder? Are you? Just ask me. See, I want to point out to you that Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, then the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You're not alone. You're never alone. Am I like this guy? Mm -hmm. Holy smokes. God, that was the best part. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take a time out. This is intermission. Mm -hmm. The other one's loaded up. The other one's already loaded up? Yep, that's right. All right, hang on. I'll just okay. switch. I'll just switch mics. Maybe. We you all out there at in, in, in Interweb Land, uh, i got to tell you, just a little country church with very little technology. <laughs> <laughs> and we're doing the best we can for Jesus, amen? Amen. amen. And so... 
this kind of stuff happens once in a while. Are we back? Yep. Yeah. Doesn't sound very loud though, does it? Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Hmm. So what do we think that God wants to bless us with? A home, a family, a hot rod? Right? <laughs> Could be. Friends. Friends. Love. Joy. Joy, peace. <clears throat> mm. So when, we, when God's talking about everything else be added unto you, what do you think he's talking about? You think he's talking about your stuff? I'm just asking. Because he doesn't really quantify or clarify. Do I, w I would be remiss if I didn't throw this in because we're going to teach a class on biblical financial principles. 1 Timothy 6.10, y'all know this. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through many sorrows. That's why I told you this class we're teaching is not a class on how to get rich, but it's a class that will give you a richness to your life that you probably didn't have before. It's a class that's going to teach you how to be godly in this area of your life. And the, and the message today might sound like we're jumping all over the place. And if you're going, yeah, what's the point? Where's he going? We're just like all over here. That's intentional. That's catchy if you're going to fall asleep. <laughs> but let me simplify. Noah loved God. And because of that, Noah was obedient to God. And because of that, God blessed and provided everything for Noah. And here's the point, until Jesus returns, until he comes back, it is never too late to change. It's never too late to tap into God's goodness. It's never too late to receive his wonderful blessings. It's never too late to receive his complete and miraculous provision. You might be saying, well, that's easy for you to say, but change is hard. Well, I'm telling you right now, that's the whole point of this message. Change is hard. You've got to rock the boat. You've got to become radical. You have to, you know. Jesus said, because you were neither hot nor cold, I vomited you out of my mouth. Listen, you don't want to be that person. You want to be that person that's invigorated and on fire for Jesus. You want to be that in unstoppable force for Jesus. Boss says, you got to quit talking about Jesus. He said, never. Because guess what? If your boss fires you for talking about Jesus, you turn around and file a suit against your boss, you own that company. Because we're guaranteed religious freedom in this country. But what drove this message, believe it or not, was uh, last week in Wednesday night in Bible study, um, my brother Jim said this and it just hit me I couldn't shake it out of my head <laughs> when it comes to change when it comes to change it has been said that it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks but you can't teach a dead dog anything <laughs> <laughs> if you wait till you're dead it's too late <coughs> Now when you're alive and breathing, start learning some new tricks. Start following Jesus with all your heart. It is never too late. It's never too late. As long as Jesus hasn't come and you're still breathing, it is not too late. The final truth I want to share with you and then we'll close is that Jesus is always with us. He is with us wherever you go. If you're a believer, Jesus is with you. So you need to take this into consideration when you're going someplace. Do I want to take Jesus in the bar? Do I want to take Jesus over to my buddy's house and smoke a bowl? 
Do I want to take Jesus when I'm mistreating somebody? Listen, you can't hide from God. None of us can. You cannot hide anything you do. The thing that you do in the most secret place that you don't want anybody to know, God knows. Mm. He tells us that he'll never leave us or forsake us. He's God. And if he says so, what is it so? If something seems too big for you, if you're having difficulty changing, if you're struggling with something that you just can't get around. I love Philippians 4, 6, and, and I love this particularly out of the New American Standard Version. I just love the way it sounds. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And here's what Jesus had to say about that. In Matthew 7, 7, he said, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Stop and think about what a wonderful adventure that was for Noah. Wow. So just stop and think about this for a minute. It's like, well, if we're going to build a boat that big, we need, uh, we need wood. There's trees. <laughs> Lord, how am I going to gather up these animals? He starts showing up. God, I can't get the door closed. Boom. It's like, it's like, wow, this is so cool, God. This has never happened before. It's raining. The water is bubbling out of the ground. Can you just imagine all the new things, all the things that never happened before, this wonderful adventure that Noah was on? Listen, you rocked the boat, and guess what? You're on an adventure with Jesus. And it's going to be for you like it is right here for Noah. There's going to be something in your life that you're going to go, man, how did this ever happen? I'm literally have to pinch myself sometimes and say, I'm a pastor? <laughs> Man, you got a great sense of humor. <laughs> but it's a supernatural love that he gives you. We, we struggle sometimes with the unlovable pe people, but he gives us that supernatural love for people. He provides everything. Don't you see? It's all, it's all Jesus. And if it is all Jesus, then what are we waiting for? Get on the bus. If you say, well, I, don't, I just don't know how to do this. Well, here, I'll tell you what it says. It says this word, let's ask him and he'll give you. Yeah. Let's seek him out and he'll be there. Let's knock and those doors are going to be open to us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we just, we lift your name on high, Lord Jesus. We love you so much. Lord, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would pursue them from this day forward relentlessly. That you would bring people into their lives and surround them with people that love you, Lord. That they would know that they're being pursued by you. That they would know that the God of the universe loves them enough to pursue them. And Lord, for those that know you here, I pray you would help us to get radical, to rock the boat, Lord, to be on fire for you. Lord, show us what that looks like. Open our eyes. Lord, just give us the instruction, Lord. Test us, Lord. Tell us what to do. Lord, we want to be on that adventure with you. And we ask for it right now. In the name of the one who saved us, Jesus Christ and Nazareth. Amen and amen. 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 I will build a boat. No, but we already said that. Oh, I was going to say, but we're doing that one again? <laughs> it's, uh, oh, I know whom I have believed.